Hi, and welcome to part seven of the post-acute COVID-19 exercise and rehabilitation or PACER project. In this section, I'm going to be talking about outpatient physical therapy considerations for strength training post-COVID-19 infection. So this is gonna be all about getting your patients who report back to your outpatient clinic ready for returning to strength training after they've been infected with COVID-19. I'm Nicole Sertica. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and certified strength and conditioning specialist. I have a private practice in Los Angeles, California, where I see predominantly athletes and other active adults and adolescents, and I do performance training and post-injury rehabilitation with them. I have no disclaimers and no conflicts of interest. By the end of this presentation, my hope is that you're going to be able to establish methods of assessing the strength of patients post-COVID-19 infection. You're going to be able to design an exercise program taking the unique presentation of this population into consideration, prescribe exercises based on auto-regulation, and be able to teach patients how to self-monitor while they're performing their home exercise program. Now, as we learned in the previous six presentations, the parts one through six of this PACER project, and if you've not listened to those and seen those already, I urge you to go now, watch parts one through six, and then come back to this section. We know that patients after COVID-19 infection will tend to present with tachycardia, hypoxemia, orthostatic hypotension, restrictive or shallow breathing, and fatigue or weakness. So we're going to have to keep these things in mind when we both assess and prescribe strength training exercises for our patients when they come back to us in the outpatient setting. Now again, the previous parts of this presentation have gone into great depth on the assessment of patients. But just to kind of make it a little more specific for the outpatient orthopedic clinic, the general assessment, of course, you'll do your standard initial evaluation, your initial interview and subjective history. Look for red flags. Again, these were mentioned in previous parts, but make sure you're doing a really thorough review of systems, particularly cardiopulmonary. Be up to date on their on the course of their COVID-19 infection, how long they were in the hospital for, were they in the ICU, were they ventilated. Make sure you know the details of their history and the course of their illness. Now some objective measures that we can do. The six minute walk test is going to look mostly at aerobic capacity and endurance. Now this is important in strength training because it'll tell us maybe how much the person is able to tolerate. Do they need longer rest breaks between exercise? Uh, do they need a few days rest between days of loading? So this is gonna be an important one for us to consider. A five times sit to stand test is going to help us assess their lower extremity strength. A timed up and go, we'll look at their balance and their transitional movements. Now, it is important to recognize that since these patients will have, you know, or may present with fatigue, orthostatic hypotension, tachycardia, restrictive breathing, hypoxemia, all those things we've discussed, it may be important to spread these tests out over the course of that initial assessment so after you do a six minute walk test, make sure you give the patient time to fully recover so that it doesn't impact the assessment of their lower extremity strength when you move on to a five time sit to stand test. 
Now, all of these tests are going to be useful to us in the assessment of these patients. However, I am a big advocate for making the exercise the assessment. So this helps to make it really patient specific and gets to those meaningful activities for the patient. So figure out what does this person need to be able to accomplish? What is the end goal? And then what can they currently accomplish? And we're gonna have to fill in that gap with the patient to get them to their end goal. So if we use the example of a grocery store worker, they're going to have to be able to be on their feet for many hours of the day. They're going to have to be able to bend down and squat down to stock shelves, reach overhead, carry boxes. So it's important that we ask them how heavy are the items that you typically have to lift? How many times in an hour do you typically perform a squat? And get to know what their, what their demands are, what the demands of that individual are, what their end goal is. And then you can assess that. So for example, in this case of the grocery store worker, if they say they have to be able to lift a 25 pound box overhead, well, we need to see where they currently are. One, can they reach overhead? Two, do they have that, that mobility and that flexibility? Two, can they lift any weight overhead? So can they lift a five pound object overhead? If that's the most they can do, then that's our entry point and we eventually have to get them to that 25 pounds being lifted overhead. So make the exercise or make the activity that they need to perform your assessment. Some considerations in prescribing strength training exercises in this population, the said principle or specificity principle. So essentially what this is saying is that the exercises or the demands that we place on a system dictate the adaptations that occur and that happens specifically. So for example, if we're doing strength training with our grocery store worker who has to be able to lift a 25 pound box overhead, it's best to make the exercises as specific, as specific to that task as possible. So we can do something like a leg press and that will of course increase their strength, but that won't specifically carry over to their overhead capacity or their overhead strength. Now this is gonna be important to consider in this population specifically because they may not have the capacity or the aerobic endurance to perform a whole bunch of exercises in a given session. So again, if what we are looking for is being able to have this person hold a 25 pound box and reach it overhead onto a shelf above them, then Yes, a leg press exercise or banded crab walks, those are great strengthening exercises, but we may be better off spending our time and spending their energy on exercises and movements that are more specific to the tasks they have to perform. So again, paying attention to their meaningful activities, and we get this information from our initial evaluation where we ask them what are the things that you have to be able to do in the course of your normal day. Now, the idea of retro programming is that we start with this end goal in mind and this helps to form our long and short term goals. So in our example, our patient who's a grocery store worker has to be able to lift a 25 pound box overhead. So we can work backwards from that and begin at our entry point, which maybe in our assessment we found that they're able to lift five pounds overhead. So we start with the end goal in mind and work backwards to what their current capacity is, and that helps us to establish our long and short-term goals. The long-term goals are really helpful to us as clinicians to make sure we're staying on track and getting that patient working towards what their end goal is and what their demands in a given day are. And the short-term goals are really nice because they're patient-centric. So it's really motivating and helpful to a patient 
to be able to say, okay, right now I can lift five pounds overhead. In two weeks, I'm gonna be able to lift 10 pounds overhead. So the short-term goal is very patient-centric, help to keep the patient motivated and on task. And the long-term goals are very helpful for us as clinicians to make sure our overall exercise prescription program is headed on the right path to getting this individual back to their activities. Some more considerations. The American College of Sports Medicine has some guidelines and recommendations on strength and hypertrophy training. Now, strength and hypertrophy are very nuanced and complex topics. You can get strength without necessarily increasing um, muscle size, so without necessarily affecting hypertrophy. And you can also get hypertrophy without necessarily increasing your strength. Now, in most cases, these two will more or less go hand in hand, um, but there are some subtle differences between them. And for the sake of this presentation, we're going to uh, just kind of briefly go over each of them and what the general recommendations are. Now, the ACSM guidelines are that for strength and hypertrophy, we should be performing two to four sets of an exercise or of loading a given muscle group two to three times per week. For hypertrophy, they recommend loading at about 70% of a one rep maximum. So that one rep max is essentially the absolute maximum amount of weight that a person can perform a given movement given movement for. So for example, somebody may be able to bicep curl 45 pounds one time and then that's it. When they try to do a second rep, they're unable to complete the movement. So their one rep max would be that 45 pounds. So then we can take 70% of that and that would be the intensity we want to work at for hypertrophy, doing 10 to 12 reps per set with about a minute and a half rest between sets. For strength, the intensity needs to be increased a little bit to about 75% of that one rep max, but this time for six to eight repetitions with about a two and a half minute rest. Now this is gonna be different in a deconditioned population. And of course, in post COVID-19 patients, they are more than likely going to present as being deconditioned. So for them, we can really do one set of 10 to 15 reps at a lower intensity, about 60 to 70% of their one rep max. Now just a little more information about strength training. We can still get some pretty significant strength gains in the untrained population just by working at 45 to 50% of their one rep max. That's really good information because it may be that this population is not necessarily able to push up to 70% or 75 or 80% of their one rep max. 50% might just be where they're comfortable. And so it's good to know that in the untrained population or the deconditioned population, we can still get strength gains at that level of intensity. But we'll see the largest strength effects in that population when we work at about 60% of the one rep max. Now, if we're working with trained athletes, people who have been lifting weights for a significant amount of time, we do need to work at a little bit higher intensity, around 80 to 85% of their one rep max. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're not likely to be working with elite level athletes in this population. And even if we are working with athletes who have had COVID-19 infection, they still can probably work at a little bit higher intensity than 45, 50, or 60% of their one rep max. Now, if we're looking specifically at hypertrophy, which is increasing the muscle mass, for novice and intermediate, we can look at the 60 to 70% of the one rep max for eight to 12 reps per set. 
And then for the more advanced population, we're going to need to increase the intensity and work at about 70 to 100% of the one rep max for 1 to 12 reps per set. But we want most of that to be more so around the 70 to 80% um, of the one rep max for 6 to 12 reps. Now again, that's not really the population we're going to be working with post-COVID-19 infection. They are more likely to present as a more novice or inter intermediate weightlifter or athlete or active individual. So we're looking more towards that 60% intensity. Now again, there's a lot of carryover between hypertrophy and strength, although they're not the same thing. And the conversation on strength and hypertrophy is much more complex and nuanced than this. Um, there are people who can get hypertrophy working down at 30% of their one rep max. But for generalization purposes, this is what we want to work with in this population. Now, historically, there's um, a couple different methods for prescribing exercise reps and sets. Two of those are the DeLorme and Oxford methods. The DeLorme method, it, now both are three sets of 10, which is something that is commonly used in outpatient physical therapy. The DeLorme method kind of has this ramp up method where the first set of 10 is performed at 50% of the 10 rep max. Now I just want to point out that this is based off, this intensity is based off the 10 rep max, not a one rep max. So obviously somebody wouldn't be able to perform 10 repetitions of a one rep max because that wouldn't really then be their one rep max. So this is 50% of their 10 rep max for 10 repetitions. Then in their second set, they would perform 10 repetitions at 75% of their 10 rep max. And then in their third set, they would perform 10 reps at 100% of their 10 rep max. So what this looks like is if a patient's 10 rep max for a back squat is 100 pounds, then in set one, they're doing 10 reps at 50 pounds. In set two, they're doing 10 reps at 75 pounds. And in set three, they're doing 10 reps at 100 pounds. Now the Oxford method kind of flips that and you would start off with 10 reps at 100 pounds. The second set would be 10 reps at 75. And then the third set would be 10 reps at 50. So both methods improve strength similarly. However, in this population, the Oxford method would probably be better than the DeLorme method simply because I don't think it would be reasonable to expect that after already doing two sets that somebody's now going to be able to push themselves to failure and performing 10 reps at 100% of their 10 rep max, especially in the population that we're going to be seeing post-COVID-19 infection where they're going to have some deconditioning and fatigue, um, maybe some tachycardia or restrictive breathing. So this isn't really the population that would be best suited for the DeLorme method. However, I would also argue that the Oxford method probably isn't ideal either. In fact, I don't think either method is going to be great for this population because I don't foresee them being able to work into failure. I don't think doing 100% of a 10 rep max is going to be the best use of resources and time for this population. So some more considerations for prescribing exercises and exercise selection is compound versus isolated movements. So all else being equal, so if we standardize for volume and match for intensity and everything else, compound movements are going to be more fatiguing on the system overall than isolated movements. So therefore, isolated movements might be better initially in this population. So an isolated movement is going to be something like a seated leg extension exercise where just a single muscle group is working. It's a basic movement. Um, now compound movements like the goblet squat shown here 
requires the coordination and the activation of multiple muscle groups at the same time. And it is a technical skill. So if we're working with a population who does not have a ton of previous experience in weightlifting, there is a significant learning curve to performing compound movements. So in this population, they wouldn't necessarily get all of the potential strength and hypertrophy benefits from the compound movements because they're still just learning the skill of the movement. So in a population that's going to be a little bit more fatigued and deconditioned, it's probably better to start with isolated movements. Another discussion on exercise selection is that of free weights versus machines. And you can see in the two pictures, the compound movement or the goblet squat is using a kettlebell or a free weight. And then the seated leg extension is utilizing a machine. If you have access to machines or if the patient has access to machines in a gym or at home, that might be a great uh, thing to consider for them because it's kind of foolproof. They don't necessarily need supervision while utilizing a machine um, in that it's a little bit safer and easier to kind of change the weights and get into position. Um, so it may be better to start with isolated movements using machines, but you can certainly do isolated movements using free weights as well. An example of that would be a bicep curl, a tricep extension, or, or movements like that. Some other considerations is the type of contractions that we're prescribing. So in an isometric exercise, um, these can be prescribed based on percentages, which I find really helpful. So if we're doing a seated leg extension um, and doing an isometric, we can say something like, okay, push into the bar, or you can use your hand and do a manually resisted isometric and say, push into my hand at about 50% of your max effort. So they're kind of self-regulating, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, but they are now self-dosing the intensity of their exercise by you just saying, do 50% of your max effort or do 70% of your max effort. So an isometric exercise, of course, is when the muscles are contracting but no movement is occurring. The one thing we want to look out for in isometric exercises in this population is that they're not holding their breath or doing Valsalva maneuver. You know, we want them to still be breathing, um, so definitely look out for that as they're performing isometrics. The other type of muscle contraction that we can prescribe is um, isotonic contractions, and that's when there's going to be a concentric and an eccentric phase. So heavy eccentrics, while great for strength and hypertrophy, they do increase inflammatory markers and muscle damage. So this is probably not the type of contraction that we're going to be wanting to prescribe in this population. As we heard in some of the previous parts of the PACER project presentations, there's already kind of this systemic inflammation going on, and we don't want to contribute further to that. To that. We want our strength training exercises to complement their overall health, not kind of go against it. So initially, at least, we may want to stay away from the heavy eccentric loading. But we can still utilize eccentrics in a low load manner. So this is going to be when they're going through a full range of the isotonic movement without the increased inflammation. So we can do this by simply manipulating the tempo of the movement. So for example, if I'm having the patient do a seated leg extension exercise that was shown on the previous slide, they can kick their leg up and that's the concentric portion because their quadricep muscle is shortening while contracting and then they can lower their shin back down or go into knee flexion. And that of course will be the eccentric or the lowering or elongating phase of the contraction, 
where the quadriceps muscles are still working but are now elongating. And if I want to make this isotonic contraction or make this movement more focused on the eccentric side of it, then I can manipulate the tempo by telling the patient to kick up for two seconds and then lower down slowly for four seconds. And that's going to emphasize the eccentric portion of the lift, um, but we can do it in a way that isn't so heavy that it increases the inflammatory markers and muscle damage. Now, another consideration for the isotonic exercises, some of the previous parts of this presentation talked about breathing and the importance of breathing some of these patients are presenting with uh, restrictive or shallow breathing. So we can try to incorporate that into some of the isotonic movements as well. For example, we can tell the patient to inhale during the concentric phase and exhale during the eccentric phase of the lift. And that's just a nice way to kind of tie in some of that deeper diaphragmatic breathing into their isotonic movements and into their strength training program. So I said that we would discuss autoregulation, and the importance of this is that when we talked before about the DeLorme and Oxford methods and being able to assess someone's strength, it relied on us knowing what their one rep max or what their 10 rep max is. And the way for us to know that is to have them go to failure. And as we've discussed, I don't necessarily think having this population go to failure on anything is really going to be the best use of their resources. Um, so instead of that, we can utilize autoregulation. And there's two methods for this. One is reps in reserve, and the other is using the rate of perceived exertion. So the way we would use reps in reserve is that the patient will self-select a weight and amount of reps that they can perform until they reach the prescribed reps in reserve. So for example, I might say to a patient, okay, you're going to do leg extensions. Stop when you feel like you can only do two or three more. So now the individual can choose what weight they want to use and then they can choose how many repetitions they can do until they feel like they can only do about two more. So it doesn't rely on me knowing what their 10 rep max is or what their one rep max is. Instead, it's really more of a patient regulated method. Similar with the rate of perceived exertion method, the patient will self-select a weight and number of reps that they can perform until they hit the prescribed RPE. So I might say that I want the patient to be able to work up to a 6 out of 10 on the RPE scale. Now they can choose how they do that. If they choose, you know, if they choose to do 30 pounds on the leg extension and they feel like they've hit that 6 out of 10 on the RPE scale when they've done 10 repetitions, then that's great. And then the next set, maybe they hit that 6 out of 10 on the RPE scale when they've done 8 repetitions, and that's also fine. That'll be the same thing when we utilize the reps and reserve method. Not every set will necessarily contain the same amount of repetitions. They're really just auto-regulating how many repetitions per set based on the prescribed reps in reserve and RPE. So not every set has to contain the same amount of repetitions. Um, they'll just choose what weight they want to use. The first set, okay, I feel like I can only do two more and I've done 12 repetitions. They rest for about two or three minutes, then they do another set. This time during that set, they felt like they could only do about two or three more repetitions when they hit nine reps, and that's fine. Um, just a note on the rest, the heavier that they go with their, their loading or the more repetitions that they do, um, probably the more rest they're going to need. Again, we do want them to recover between sets, especially in this population. We don't really want to work them into too much fatigue. So give them 
sufficient amount of time to rest and recover. Now I find this chart helpful to give to patients when we're using autoregulation. It kind of converts RPE to reps in reserve. So if I tell a patient, I want you to work up to a seven out of 10 on the RPE scale, they know that that means, okay, I could probably do about three more repetitions. Um, if I tell them that I want them to go until they feel like they can only do one more repetition, they can see that that means that they're working at around a nine out of 10 on the RPE scale. So I find this chart useful for my own purposes and also to give to patients for their home exercise program and just even in the clinic while they're exercising. Now it's gonna be important for us to monitor the patients while they're with us and then of course for them to be able to monitor themselves while they're at home. So ways that we can monitor them in the clinic and like the previous presentations have shown us Again, there's a lot of common symptoms and presentations that the patients will have. So we definitely wanna make sure that we're taking their vitals. Um, definitely doing vitals at the beginning of the session. And then if you notice any change in the patient or after um, a given exercise, you wanna check their vitals again, that's fine. Um, Simple observation, right? So we can do what's called the talk test. So if the patient is able to hold a conversation with you while they're performing an exercise, then we can feel pretty confident that they're not working into too much fatigue. So that's a really nice and easy way. Um, and everyone likes to talk to their patients anyway and have kind of that small talk and clinic banter with your patients. So that's a good time to do that. Pulse oximetry is also a great way. We want to make sure that they're not dipping below um, a certain threshold of O2 set. So whether that's you know making sure they don't dip below 90%, make sure they don't dip below 85% um, is going to be more patient specific and also depending on what setting you're in. Um, if they do start to dip below 90, typically I would have the patient sit down, take a little bit of a rest, and then make sure that they get back up again above 90 and then we can continue. Now at home, obviously we're not gonna be there to observe them, right? So we can't see their face turning bright red as they're doing a Valsalva maneuver while holding a plank um, and therefore being able to tell them to stop. So it's important that they're able to monitor, their, monitor themselves at home as well. I think that use of the RPE scale is really a nice way for them to monitor themselves. Again, it can help guide their exercise prescription as well. Wearable heart rate monitors I think are great, whether they have an Apple Watch or a Garmin or any of the other um, wearable heart rate monitors that are on the market nowadays. There's some really inexpensive ones. Um, and just having them check their heart rate maybe at the end of each set and then you can always have them ensure that their heart rate gets back down to rest or near resting levels before they start their next set. So we can use the heart rate tracking not only to make sure that you know they're not getting tachycardic, but also to kind of help guide the exercise prescription and specifically their rest breaks. So we can say, okay, when your heart rate gets back down to your normal resting level, then you can begin your next set. Or, okay, when your heart rate gets back down to 50% of your max heart rate, then you can begin again with your next set. Pulse oximetry, you can actually find some really good pulse oximeters on Amazon for $20, $25. So um, it may be a worthwhile investment for your patients to make simply ordering one on Amazon or picking one up in a local drugstore or pharmacy um, may be worthwhile for your patient. And again, just give them the specific guidelines that if they get below a certain percentage, you want them to sit down, work on their deep breathing, their breathing techniques, diaphragmatic breathing, and then once they get back above a certain threshold, then they can begin again.
And finally, some other considerations that we want to take into account when prescribing strength training exercises in this population is their training status. And we touched on this a little bit before, but if you're working with someone who has never weight trained before, has never strength trained before, um, then the exercise prescription might need to be a little more simple. You need to just focus on two or three things for that person and not go overboard with the exercise prescription. Um, they will typically, in untrained individuals, will start to see some positive adaptations earlier on. Um, but again, we want to make sure that we recognize there's going to be a learning curve with some of the more compound movements and therefore it's probably beneficial to stick with the more isolated movements, maybe use some more machines if they're comfortable with them instead of free weights, but that will be largely patient specific on what their, their specific needs and goals and what they feel comfortable with. Progressive overload is important for us to recognize because we still do need to gradually progress their volume and or intensity in order to continue getting the adaptations we're seeking. So it's not good enough for us to just prescribe an exercise program and then never progress the intensity or the volume of it over time because then there's no reason for the body to commit more resources to increasing strength or hypertrophy. So we need to gradually progress them, just bearing in mind in this population that that may be a little bit more of a slow and gradual process than it would normally be. Now the repeated bout effect is essentially a protective effect against muscle damage and delayed onset muscle soreness in subsequent bouts of performing a previously performed exercise. So this is something that's talked a lot about when we discuss eccentric exercises. Um, so if we think about something that's a really kind of heavy eccentric exercise like the Nordic hamstring exercise. A lot of patients, in fact most, most patients, will say that they feel really sore after their first time doing that. The repeated bout effect tells us that that level of muscle damage and muscle soreness will not be quite as high the next time that they do that exercise. So Again, we do want to stay away from increasing inflammatory markers. We don't want to add to the already high systemic inflammation that's going on in this population. We don't want to push them too far into fatigue, and we, don't, we aren't really looking to create muscle soreness at this point. Um, but if that does happen, know that there is this repeated bout effect where in subsequent sessions that should not be an issue. And then frequency of training. Now we definitely want to allow for recovery. So whether that means we schedule them twice a week or three times a week, making sure that there's at least one day in between their sessions with you. Now if that can't be avoided for a scheduling conflict or whatever reason, um, then try to at least just give at least 24 to 48 hours between loading the same muscle group. So if you can't avoid seeing a patient on back-to-back -back days, which happens sometimes, then just plan ahead that on day one, maybe you're going to work the quadricep muscle group, and then on day two, you're going to work more of the hamstrings and the glutes. That way you're not loading the quads two days in a row or loading the hamstrings two days in a row. We do want to allow this population in particular to recover between bouts of exercise. Okay, that's all for part seven, returning to strength training post COVID-19 infection. I hope you found this information useful and helpful. Just remember to allow your patients to take their time, gradually progress them, and allow them to self-select a their most meaningful activities and therefore their most meaningful exercises, the most specific exercises to their meaningful activities. Um, try not to overload them with too many exercises. Just stick to kind of what's the most important and the high priority, the high ticket items for that individual. Um, and then you can get strength and hypertrophy gains 
even at relatively low or moderate intensities. Okay, thanks so much for watching and listening. And again, I'm Nicole Sertica. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and email me. My email address is Nicole at NicoleSerticaPhysio.com. And I would just like to thank the American Physical Therapy Association and the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy for putting this project together. Thanks.